I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and we're here today to talk to you about the Bushnell Elite Tactical HDMR 3.5 to 21 power by 50 millimeter rifle scope. I've had this scope for a little while. I've spent quite a bit of time behind it. I probably have upwards of a thousand rounds shot through rifles equipped with this scope in varying competitions and informal shooting situations. Uh, it has worked extremely well. We're going to go ahead and we're going to run through some of the features on the scope and then we're going to tell you how it worked out at the range and then finally uh, some of the things that I dislike about the scope or would like to see changed about it. First of all, real fast, the features on the scope. Starting from the back, we have a fast focus eyepiece or diopter adjustment. What this allows you to do is quickly adjust the focus of the reticle to your eye. You just simply grab it and turn it until the reticle is focused nice and clearly. We have a nice smooth ocular housing. There's nothing to stick out or to grab your hand as you operate the bolt. Then we have this nice uh, knurled uh, power selector ring. It's not really knurled as much as there are protrusions sticking up on it to help you get a good purchase on it when you turn it. It rotates through approximately 180 degrees going from 3.2 power all the way up to 21 power. It has an appropriate tension on it to keep it from flopping around, but it's not so difficult that you're moving the rifle around while you're trying to adjust your power setting. Forward from that, we have a 34 millimeter main tube. A 34 millimeter main tube gives you a little bit of extra strength to the system, and it gives you extra room for the elevation and windage adjustments internal to the scope. In the center, we have our turret housing. The turret housing is fairly compact for a scope with turrets of this size. They leave you an appropriate amount of room to be able to slide the scope forward and back, and it's not so large as to limit your mounting options. The turrets on the Bushnell Elite Tactical HDMR are locking turrets. They used a really uh, neat and simple method to lock the turrets. Both the elevation and windage are locking. When they are in the down position, as they are now, the turrets are locked. You can't move them. To unlock the turrets, you simply grab a hold of them and pull up. Due to the shape and size of the turret, it's very easy to grab a hold of it and pull it up with gloved hands on. When the turret reaches the top of its travel, you can then turn it to do your adjustment. If you wish to lock it, you just push it back down and it's locked. There really isn't any detent to tell you when it's fully unlocked. You just hit the end of the travel. The turrets work very well. They're extremely easy to use. Just pull them up, set it, push it back down. Nothing really to get in the way or to cause you any problems. Now the turrets are very easily re-zeroed by use of the center screw. Uh, Bushnell was really thinking on this because one of the things that I'm sure any of us that have been shooting for any amount of time have done is we've rushed out to the range to zero a new rifle scope and forgot our tools. Didn't bring anything to adjust those little uh, grub screws or little set screws in the scope and it's really annoying. Well, Bushnell put a coin slot screw in the top of their turrets on the HDMR. The screw is actually designed to be able to use a quarter or a washer or something of that nature, but it's actually large enough that you can even use the back of a knife blade to loosen and tighten it if you wish. Now one caution though is if you go to use a screwdriver on it, because of the way the screw is designed, you can cause some damage to it. So I would suggest sticking with using a washer or a coin to adjust that. But Zeroing the turrets is very simple. You just back the screw out, you pull the turret straight up off the housing, turn it to zero, push it back down, put your screw back in, tighten it down, and you're done. Forward to the turret housing, we have the objective bell. This is a 50 millimeter objective. In my opinion, 50 millimeter objectives with good glass and good coatings is about the upper limit of where I want to be on a tactical rifle scope. Most of the situations that I've been in in the real world, 50 millimeter objective transmits enough light with good glass and coatings for me to see what I need to see. If it's a situation beyond that, then we're getting into situations where we need to start using night vision devices and not rely on ambient light. The 50 millimeter objective, it pulls in quite a good deal of light. It doesn't actually pull in light, and that's kind of a misspeak. It allows the light to transmit through to the rest of the optics assembly. 
um, works very well. When you start getting up into 56 millimeter and beyond that, you start to limit your mounting options. So 50 millimeter, I think, is a good compromise between getting the most light that you would need in most situations you're utilizing a day scope in and good mounting height. The HDMR also comes with a sunshade. The sunshade very simply just screws on onto your objective bell and it actually uh, screws in pretty easily. It takes quite a few turns to get it on which is actually a nice feature when it does it's almost flush so I'm just not going to take the time to screw it all the way on. It does add some length to the HDMR. Now one of the big benefits of the HDMR is its compact size. You generally do not find a scope with this power range 3.5 to 21 power as short as this scope is. That makes it very nice. You're not hanging way out there. You have room to mount a forward mounted night vision device if you want. You're not stretching things out and really getting the package overall. It allows the HDMR to be mounted on a nice compact rifle and still be in place and not really look obtrusive. The Sunshade does add some length to it, but what we found when we're shooting is if I have that sun forward of me, it's easy to get into a situation because you have a large objective close to the end of the bell where you get some glare into the scope. It is not a situation where it would prevent me from making a shot, but it is annoying, and if you're trying to punch tiny, tiny groups in paper, then it's much nicer to have some shade that will allow you to get a cleaner sight picture. So it's nice that they include the sunshade so you can use it if you want or not if you don't. Usually that's an added expense. Also included with the HDMR are plastic scope caps. The scope caps work. They're really nothing fancy. Uh, they are long enough that when you put the sunshade on, they will stretch out and still cover the sunshade. So at least they were thinking on that part of it. Now we took the HDMR out to the range and because I really originally took it out of the box, mounted it to a rifle and started shooting it, I didn't do any tests, any tracking tests or anything to begin with. I actually mounted it up for the first time the night before a match. I zeroed it and then drove on with it and the scope worked perfectly. It worked exactly as I would expect it to be. I took the data that I already had on the rifle from the previous rifle scope and it translated over to this scope just fine. Didn't have any problems hitting extended range targets with it. So it worked. Uh, it tracked exactly with the tracking data from previous scope, which I had verified the accuracy of the turrets on it. I actually shot it for quite some time before we got to the range and ran some tracking tests on it. So I wasn't surprised at all when we got to the range and we found that it did track true. We did one of our tracking drills where we measure the offset of an aiming point through the reticle and then dial the correction onto the turrets and we move back and forth through several different points. What this will tell us is if the turrets are calibrated to the same adjustment that the reticle is. If they're not, then what you'll see is as we move to higher and higher points that require more adjustment to hit, you will see an offset between the shot and the point of aim expand. Now obviously you have to be using a very accurate rifle to do this and the AI AE Mark II and 243 that I have sitting underneath it right now is a very accurate rifle so I was sure what I was seeing was either issues with the operator or the optic and not the rifle. The only issue I saw was when I fired the first shot to zero the scope up I think I pulled it just a little bit because when we came up and made our adjustments the offset that I was seeing between the point of aim and point of impact remained the same through the different spots. If there was a problem with the optic, then you would see that offset grow or shrink depending on which direction your adjustments were going. So the scope passed that test just fine. The next test I did on the scope was a return to zero test. What I'll do there is I fire on a separate aiming point with the scope set at zero. I'll then dial the scope up one full revolution and then one full revolution back and fire another shot. Now I expect to see that next shot to stack or group right with the original shot. Next I'll dial all the way up to the extent of the scope's travel all the way back down and fire another shot. And again I want to see those shots group right together. And in this case they did. It worked just fine. Our shots grouped right together within the accuracy that I would expect out of the system. 
So this gives you the confidence to know that if you're shooting a long range competition and you have to dial to a thousand yard shot and then crank it all the way back and take a very precise hundred yard shot, you know you can do it. The scope's gonna return back to zero. You don't have to tap on the turrets or rattle anything or cross your fingers or pray to the gods. It will return to zero and you'll be good to go. Overall, it passed all the tests that we had put it through. Uh, usually I will do a dunk test and freeze test and, and various things like that, but the reality of it is I've used this scope for uh, several months now and it's been rained on, it's been bumped, it's been it's ridden around in the back of a patrol car and I haven't seen any issues with it at all. Now let's talk about some design issues that were kind of a little bit of an irritation to me or things that I would like to see changed. First of all, we'll go back to that fast focus eyepiece. I really dislike fast focus eyepieces and the reason is that once you get the diopter setting set to your eye, you really want to be able to lock that off. It's not something that changes from shooting situation to shooting situation. It can change with age and health, et cetera, but that's a biological issue. It's not something that needs to be adjusted constantly on the rifle scope. What I like to see is I like to see a locking ring to where once I get the diopter set, I can dial a locking ring down, jam it against the diopter adjustment and keep it in place no matter what kind of scope cap I have or what kind of rough handling the scope goes through. Uh, only one of the scopes that we've tested in the last year actually has a locking diopter and I was very happy to see it. Some of the higher end military geared rifle scopes are starting to appear with locking diopters again. So I would really like to see that across the board on tactical scopes, especially on flagship scopes. The next kind of slight irritation that I had is the lack of any kind of illumination for the reticle. This is a first focal plane rifle scope, which means that as the power setting changes, the reticle still covers the same amount of the target, no matter what the power is set at. This means one mil covers one mil of the target at 21 power, it still covers one mil of the target at 3.5 power. The problem that you run into is in low light or in cluttered backgrounds, when you dial down to that low magnification to give you the best light transmission or to give you the widest field of view, that reticle appears to get really fine in your sight picture. And it's very easy to lose a non-lit reticle in a cluttered background in a dimly lit environment. So for a law enforcement shooter, a illuminated reticle is a very nice thing to have. Now I talked to Bushnell about this and the main reason it does not have an illuminated reticle is because the scope was more geared towards military purposes and in the military if you are getting into a situation where the environment is that dim and you're having trouble picking up your reticle it's time to put your night vision device on your rifle. Most law enforcement departments right now do not have the budget to afford night vision. They're getting better and it's filtering out there. There are quite a few departments that do have it but overall the vast majority of officers are not going to have the money to drop a five to ten thousand dollar night vision scope in front of the rifle. So they need to be able to rely on their day optic for a wide variety of shooting environments. An illuminated reticle is one of those wonderful things that it's there when you need it, it's unobtrusive when you don't. The next thing coming forward to the turrets is these are five mil per rev turrets and they have no zero stop, which means if your buddy wants to play a joke on you and dial you one rev off and then lock your scope back down, you have no idea that you're not where you need to be when you get on the scope. There are hash marks to tell you what rev you're on, but unless you memorize the hash marks or what I suggest is actually black out the hash marks that you're not using, then you won't know by just looking at it. I never memorize the number of hash marks. I write them down in my data book. That way, if I need to refer back to that, then I can dial the scope back. But it's something that's very easy to get lost on in a competition, and I've watched guys do it and blow stages on it before. So it's nice to have zero stops to where you just dial down, bang it against that zero stop, and know that you're zeroed out. The next little irritation I have is the screws that they use to lock the turrets down after you make your zero adjustment are a little bit of a soft material. Uh, they're initially designed for coins and obviously coins are made of silver and copper and kind of softer materials. Uh, 
Um, the if you're not using a coin, if you go and use a hardened washer or the back of a knife blade or a screwdriver to adjust these, you're going to start tearing up the coin slot in the screw. So it's just it's a very very small thing because the average guy is going to put this on his rifle. He's going to zero it and probably not going to re-zero it more than once a year. This scope's on a quick release mount. I swapped it through several different rifles during the course of the testing, so I did re-zero the scope several different times. And it's starting to have a little bit of wear on the screws or on the coin slots and the screws. Not a big deal, just one of my little tiny things. Uh, other than that, is an excellent rifle scope. Uh, it is really a performer in its price point. So in the approximately $1,000 price point, they're running around $1,000 to $1,200 street price for this scope right now. And it, is, it gives you a lot of value for your money in that price point. Unfortunately, the things that I pointed out, an illuminated reticle and zero stops will probably raise the price point of it and then it changes the level that it has to compete at. But for a first focal plane rifle scope, with this power range and this feature set, this is an incredible deal. The reticle choices that you have for this optic are the standard mill dot reticle, the G2 reticle, the Horus H59, and the Horus Tremor 2 reticle. Now our evaluation copy here has the Tremor 2 reticle in it. I've also shot the H59 and the G2 reticles. I have not shot the standard mill dot. I don't really see any reason to purchase a standard mill dot reticle in this rifle scope. My suggestion for most shooters out there would be go with the G2 reticle. The G2 reticle was designed in cooperation with George Gardner at GA Precision and it works very well. It's very well thought out for a field reticle and it Basically what it has is on the elevation stadia line, it has horizontal lines that are marked out in mills to allow you to use accurate wind holds no matter what your elevation hold is. With a standard mill dot reticle, you end up holding into dead space. This allows you to hold for both elevation and windage and to do so accurately, which is my preference when I'm on the clock and time limits are really limited. Dial when you can, but most of the time when you're on the time clock, you're gonna be holding. So it's a very well thought out reticle and it really is not cluttered at all. When you get into the H59 reticle, uh, the H59 reticle works very well. However, it's got a lot of clutter to it. If you're shooting at smaller targets and cluttered backgrounds, then you can lose stuff in the reticle. That's just my opinion of it. Uh, the Tremor 2 reticle, I am not a great big huge fan of. As I said, this rifle, there, this scope here has the Tremor 2 reticle in it. I spent quite a bit of time shooting with this reticle. Uh, we are going to do a separate video with my opinion on the Tremor 2 reticle, so watch for that. We're not going to go into it here because there's so much stuff going on in that reticle. It would triple the time of this video to cover it all. So check for our Tremor 2 video uh, coming up in the not too distant future and we'll talk about it there. The HDMR utilizes a side focus parallax adjustment and is marked in 50 yards to infinity. Now, I really like parallax knobs that are marked. The parallax turrets that are unmarked, like some manufacturers have out there, make it difficult to quickly get on your parallax setting. If I have to engage a very precise target at an intermediate range, then what I like to do is get down behind the scope, dial the turret directly to that range, then look through the scope, move my head around, and fine tune it until the parallax is out. Now once I get done fine tuning it, the actual range of the target may not line up with the range on the parallax knob. That's not a big deal because there are a variety of factors that will affect how that knob ends up, or how the parallax ends up being dialed out. But what it allows me to do is quickly get to a starting point and then fine tune from there. When you just have hash marks or dots or something and no actual ranges printed on it, you kind of have to guesstimate where your starting point is going to be. Or you got to get in there with a silver sharpie and start writing numbers on your, tar or on your turret. So I like to have yardage lines marked on the turret. It's just a personal preference. But the turret on the HDMR worked very well. The parallax is smooth to adjust. It has just enough tension that it's not flopping around, but it has it's loose enough that you can adjust it without throwing the position of the rifle off. So 
Very good job right there. Overall, I really like the feature set that the HDMR offers for the price point. I think it is a very good rifle scope for those guys out there that are looking for a mid-range scope to shoot competitions with, or just to go out and have some fun plinking with steel. Uh, it definitely gives you a ton of value for the money that you're spending on it. It doesn't leave anything on the table. Uh, they're just the tiny little points that I mentioned that I wish that they would uh, upgrade to make this a stellar rifle scope. The problem, of course, being when they make those upgrades, it's probably going to raise the purchase price. So for what you're getting right here, I think it's priced appropriately and I think you're going to be good to go. I don't think you're going to be disappointed if you purchase this scope. Thanks for watching the video. If you liked it, please give us a thumbs up. If you've got any questions or comments, please leave them in the questions section below or send them to us on Facebook or Twitter. If you're a subscriber, thank you very much. If you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. It doesn't cost you anything. We won't send you a junk mail and YouTube will let you know when we release new videos. Until next time, get out and shoot.